You know, um, Sister Denise, the scripture reading, thank you so much, Serena, for reading that for us. Um, I'd like to read it one more time in Psalms 31. Sister Denise, this might be appropriate here. Um, but it says here, praise the Lord. This is King David. The psalm is saying, praise the Lord, for he has shown me the wonders of his unfailing love. And he kept me safe in my, when my city was under siege or when my city was under attack. God kept me safe when my city was under attack. This is God's faithfulness. Amen. Can someone testify here this morning? Let me ask you a question here this morning as we set up the stage here. Have you ever looked around the world and felt a little bit overwhelmed? Uh, when you see the people around you, let me explain a little bit. When we look at people, sometimes we see brokenness. And this brokenness is often very evident in the cities. Yes, in the cities, we see crime, do we not? Say mercy. In the cities, we see poverty, do we not? Say mercy. In the cities, we see hatred. We see apathy, right? People don't care. They and, and sometimes it's easy to see this around us and feel like giving up on people, say mercy. Sometimes it feels easy to give up on places that seem that they've gone just a little too far. Mm. What do we do when people, when places, and sometimes even the cities seem unlovable because the crime is so high because the hatred is so high the violence is so high many of us we find ourselves avoiding certain places do we not we avoid certain neighborhoods and even denise has spoken of one neighborhood that's not the greatest just now at the very least we are left wondering what do we do how do we approach the situation? When people in our lives, when, when their core values and when their core beliefs don't match with our values or our beliefs, what should our response be? Because typically when we talk about the city and the things that happen in the city, sometimes just as a, this is a general statement. We're not saying that every single person in a city is like this. Um, but the crime is higher. You know, the violence is higher. And just in a general sense, what do we do? And, of course, um, as Christians, we have a calling, do we not? Let's take a look at some responses from the Bible on how to deal with this situation, how to deal with the city and the people in the city. I'd like you to turn your Bible to the book of Acts. The book of Acts chapter 16. Just turn there and we're going to read a verse. Let me give you a little bit of context of what's going on here in the book of Acts. For those of you who may need a little help, uh, Acts is found in the New Testament right after the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. You know, here's a little story. When I started reading the Bible when I was 18... Um, I start somebody told me to start in Matthew and uh, you know I had read the Bible as a little kid but I started in Matthew and it's the story of Jesus right it's the gospel and then you go to Matthew uh, Mark I went to Mark and it's the same story and then I went to Luke and it's the same story and then I went to John and it's a pretty much the same story a little different but it's the same story and I remember reading that I thought is Acts is are all the books the same it's just the story of Jesus over and over and over of course it's not but that's just a little funny story I gave you while you found Acts chapter 16 let me give you a little bit of context of what's going on Acts chapter 16 we have Paul and his partner Silas which are in the city and they're there proclaiming you know teaching and all of this and there is this uh, demon possessed woman who is like blurting out things, right? So this demon-possessed woman belonged to um, sort of a business there, some fortune-telling business. And this woman, so her hires or employers or whatever you want to call it, they were there, 
and they had her and because she was demon possessed she would be able to trick people into thinking that she knows the future because that's what demons do but here comes Paul and Silas and this woman sees them and then she starts crying out some crazy things but they were true that's what's kind of interesting about it they were saying like hey look at Paul and Silas these are the messengers of God right but you know <laughs> we would think like why would because Paul got irritated right by that she, she get, just kept saying those are the messengers of God those are the messengers of God and you may scratch your head well she's saying a true statement right like why why is Paul getting so irritated about that right because Paul says hey demons in the name of Jesus get out and so they leave and she's left without demons so these like employers of her they get upset but let's rewind a little bit what, what's the problem with that you know oftentimes and this is just a side note here oftentimes it's not about the message but where the message is coming from can you imagine this demon possessed woman is saying the messengers of God do you know what that does to the credibility of the actual gospel so we don't want it coming from there so Paul says get out get out of there and these guys are upset so they take Paul to the authorities they, they, they call the police and they say hey these guys are messing things up here so Paul and Silas get beaten and then they get thrown into jail and then the story continues in Acts chapter 16 that this is just a little review you can read it on your own at home Paul is in jail and the night comes and there is a great earthquake that happens that is so great it shakes the ground that the cells of the the, the doors of the jail cell open right up and Paul and Silas are there and they're like oh the doors are open let me ask you a quick question what would you do at that moment run run where out freedom I heard freedom freedom you know what Paul did he stayed it's interesting this is really interesting because Acts chapter 16 I mean this is probably another sermon for another day but I'm giving you some nuggets here Acts chapter 16 has some really interesting activity Belinda welcome home uh, it really interesting activity from the enemy of souls from Satan it's just it's just really interesting to me because you have um, you have right here this woman crying out like truth right she's saying these are the messengers of God that's true but it's coming from Satan so it's fishy it's fishy now we have here that this earthquake and the doors like are wide open listen if you guys were in jail unjustly you know and you know it and suddenly there's an earthquake and the doors open right up what are you gonna think who do you think it's gonna be God did it I mean that whoa this is a miracle you know what I think I think that that earthquake did not come from God now we know from the scriptures that Satan has power over the elements he has some power over the elements you can take a look at the book of Job for example chapter 1 and you see that uh, 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 there's a great wind that comes and kills Job's kids and uh, there's fire coming down in Revelation there's a scripture that says uh, Revelation 13 13 that Satan causes fire to come down from heaven so we know that Satan has power over the elements so it is very very likely and I believe that it was Satan shaking up things saying like Paul get out of here run freedom because Satan knew something was up and God was at work and so we have the guard the guard is sitting there and uh, you know he's looking and he says oh no all the doors are open you know what happens to the guards the Roman guards who just kind of you know mess up the Romans didn't play around so he got scared and he was about to kill himself because he said oh no and as he was about to do it Paul welcome home brother Paul says don't do it we're still here and this guy is so amazed at the situation 
that he says, whoa, you guys are still here, and they begin a conversation. Long story short, this guy ends up giving his life to God and getting baptized, him and his household. Hallelujah. See, Satan wanted Paul to leave and Silas to leave. Maybe he thought, I can get these guys to leave by having this pestering woman. Maybe I can get these guys to leave if they get thrown in jail and they get beat up a little bit, and now this is their chance. Nope. The Holy Spirit led Paul. He said, I'm not leaving. We're here. Let's baptize you. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about the gospel. And then the morning comes, and so the officials, the Roman officials, they send a message to the jailer, and they say, hey, let Paul and Silas go. They're free to go. And so the jailer comes to Paul and Silas and says, hey, guys, you're free to go. Now, at this point here, Danny, what would you do? Go, right? <laughs> go, leave. Get out. Let's get out of here. So they're free to go. But Paul says, no, I'm not leaving. Can you imagine? Denise, I don't know how appropriate this is for your testimony, but this is kind of crazy here, right? The Lord works in mysterious ways, right? So Paul says, no. I'm going to stay here in jail. In fact, those guys over there, they unjustly beat us and threw us in jail without a trial, and we're Roman citizens. I'm a Roman citizen, and Silas is a Roman citizen, and that was a big no-no. Message goes out to them, and these guys, if they want us out, they got to come themselves. That's what Paul said. So these guys get the message, and they're like, oh, boy. Oh, boy. And then so they hear it. They travel to the jail, and this is where we pick it up in verse 38. Verse 38. The question at hand here, as I've given you this little bit of context, is what do we do about the city? What do we do about the people in the city? And this is one possible response right here. It says, are you there? Verse 38. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. Verse 39, so they came to the jail and they apologized to them. And then they brought them out and begged them to what, everyone? To leave the city. Beg them to leave the city. Sometimes it seems easier to leave, doesn't it? It just seems like the easier thing to do. Let's just leave. When things get tough, let's just leave. We might want to retreat to a safer place. We might want to retreat to an easier place. Even Paul had the chance to leave multiple times, but he didn't. But have you ever wanted to do the same? Give up on certain people, give up on certain neighborhoods, or give up on a certain, even a church? You ever felt like that? It's easier to leave? That's one possible option to the question. But there's another possibility, and for that, I'd like for you to turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 tells another story here. And this is really a remarkable story. Luke chapter 9. One thing that you can do with the city is just leave it. Just leave the city, right? Luke chapter 9. Verses 53. And you know what? We'll, we'll rewind just a little bit just to give you some context. Welcome home, brother. Welcome home. Okay, verse 53. We're in Luke chapter 9, 53. And we're going to, uh, to begin actually in verse 51, just so that you can catch the whole story. Are we all there? Say amen. <clears throat> all right. As the time drew near for him, that is Jesus, to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Jesus was going where? To the city, to Jerusalem, right? And he sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. But the people of the village did welcome Jesus with open arms. Is that what your Bible says? Oh, let me tell you that sometimes on our mission, on our way to the cities, 
The cities will not welcome you. Okay, so let's just get that out of the way. Sometimes they don't welcome you, and here they were not welcoming Jesus. So he says, no, 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 no. Uh, but the people of the village, verse 53, did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. So they had a little bit of prejudice. You're going to Jerusalem? Coming here to Samaria? No, you're not welcome here. Okay? All right, verse 54. When James and John saw this, they said to the Lord, Lord, let's love on them. Is that what they say? Is that what your Bible says? What does your Bible say? I mean, the audacity here. What does it say? They said, <clears throat> can you believe these people? Okay, here we are. I want you to get the picture here. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he sees this village, which, of course, he's going to minister to. The disciples know that he's going to minister to them. They know that. And all right, here we go. Hey, send a couple messengers to prepare the way. And they come back with this message like, no, we don't want you. You're going to Jerusalem? No way. So James and John say, Lord, <clears throat> listen, you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, bother yourself with this. I, we got an idea. Should we call fire from heaven to destroy this village? What does that remind you of, by the way? Sodom and Gomorrah. So these guys thought themselves wise enough to say, you know what, this village, the nerve with this village, can we get some fire and just throw it down? Let me tell you why they even thought they had, I mean, I, you're probably thinking like, what, why in the world would they even think they could say that? Well, let, let me give you a little bit of context. If you rewind to Luke chapter 9, the beginning of the chapter, this tells you that Jesus sent out his disciples to go minister and preach the gospel of the kingdom, and he gave them authority to cast out demons and to heal people, which they had done, right? So they're coming back from this missionary journey, and they've casted out demons, and they've healed people, and God has worked through them right so they are now full of themselves mercy beloved even in our doing God's work God can give us so much success that we could become full of ourselves and then we could start comparing ourselves with other people and cast judgment on other people is that making sense oh look at me look at all the tithe that i pay look at all the times i go to church look at all the positions i have at church look at me i am better than they are but be careful because the scripture says that jesus rebuked these guys you see their problem is in their success in ministry, they begin to compare themselves to other human beings, other people who are sinful. And they stopped comparing themselves to our standard, which is Jesus Christ, who came down to earth and lived a perfect life and died a death that he did not deserve, but that you deserved and that I deserved. See, when we compare ourselves with Jesus and that life, we're going to see that we too are sinners in need of grace. Because otherwise, we run the danger of saying some crazy statement like, God, let's just destroy this village with fire. Oh, yeah, option number two on how we deal with the city is condemn them judged them this is option number two this is what the disciples james and john one of the top disciples in the inner circle by the way said let's judge them let's condemn them they're not worthy of our time so the first kind of uh, solution or first option should i say is let's leave the city just like the officials told paul leave the city and here no let's condemn the city let's judge them but beloved we are not called to judge. We are not called to judge. We are called to love people. Amen? There is a time when we will judge. Revelation chapter 20 talks about that, but that's after Jesus coming. And we actually do have some judgment that we're doing right now here on planet Earth at this moment. And who we're judging is not each other. We are judging God. We are judging who, everyone? 
We're judging God. We're determining whether God is good or whether he's not. And the decision for you to stick around, the decision for you to stay, testifies of whatever judgment you've cast. Either God is good, amen, or he's not. And if you believe he's good, you're here, amen, because he is good, no matter the circumstance. That is what we're judging. We're judging God, but we're not judging each other. We're called to love each other, amen. There's yet another possibility, and for this one, I'd like for you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. There's another possibility still of a, a, an approach. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. <clears throat> Listen to this. Different occasion. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Peter is there close by. And Jesus, from then on, Jesus began, verse 21. You there with me? Matthew 16, 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, to the city, and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed. But on the third day, hallelujah, he would raise from the dead. Now listen to Peter's response. And you know this. We know this. But let's read it. Okay. Peter took him aside. He said, hey, Lord, come here. Let me talk to you. And Peter reprimanded Jesus. Listen. Listen. The word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We are not the lamp. The word of God is the lamp. And we are guided by the word of God, not the other way around. We don't come to try to tell God what to do because James and John did it. Hey, let's throw some fire down here. Do we actually think that we have the wisdom of God to be able to determine who is righteous and who is not righteous? And then here, G uh, Peter began to reprimand Jesus and saying such things. Like, he said, heaven forbid, Lord. He said, this will never happen to you. But listen to the response again. With, uh, Peter and, uh, with James and John, Jesus rebuked. And here is another rebuke. Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me. Get away from me, Satan. Talking to Peter. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human perspective, horizontal, instead of from God's point of view, vertical, kingdom culture, right? So one of the options here is just to avoid the city altogether. One option here is if you're in the city, you leave the city, right? That's what, the, that's what the, the officials wanted Paul to do. The other option here is to condemn the city. And here, the third option is just to avoid the city. You know what? I'm just going to avoid the city, okay? But here's the question of this morning. How did Jesus act? What would Jesus, WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? What was his way of responding to the brokenness and to the crime and to the hurt and to the pain happening in the cities? Luke 19.41 says that as he came closer to Jerusalem, and a little context for this, this is talking about the triumphal entry. This is when Jesus finally came. His ministry was coming to a climax. He's riding on a donkey. We have people crying out, Hosanna, throwing their garments on the floor so the donkey could you know, walk on that, and he arrives, and he looks at Jerusalem, and Luke 19, 41 says that as he came closer to Jerusalem, he saw the city ahead, and he began to weep. He began to weep. Jesus wept for the city. He saw its brokenness, and his heart was moved with compassion. Jesus didn't abandon the city. Jesus didn't condemn the city. Jesus didn't avoid the city. Jesus engaged the city. 
knowing full and well what awaited him because you're worth it. And what does it mean? I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. What does it mean? Listen, if, you've, if you're sitting here thinking that God has forgotten about you, he has not. See, maybe human beings have left you and left you on the wayside and forgot about you. Maybe human beings have condemned you and judged you because they want to define you on an action that you did instead of who you are as a child of God. Maybe human beings are even avoiding you, not making eye contact and going somewhere else. You know, maybe they're doing that, but I want you to know that when Jesus looks at you, he weeps because he's compassionate about you, because he loves you and he wants you so badly. Matthew 9.35, Matthew 9.35 says the following. This is how Jesus did what he did. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. Two important points here because they go hand in hand. Jesus went to the cities and he healed. Amen? He healed. In order for you to even know what you need to heal, what we need to heal, we need to ask those questions, right? Hey, we, go and meet some needs. Does somebody need their lawn to be mowed? Does somebody need for you to pick up groceries for them? Does somebody need a ride because they don't have a working car and they need to come to church? You need to go see what the need is, and then we need to meet it, right? But this is very important, too. It says right here that Jesus traveled back again to 35 through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom, kingdom culture. Jesus was teaching because it's not good enough just to go meet needs and leave them alone, right? That's not good. We have a precious truth that we have to share with the world. We have a kingdom culture that we ought to share with the world. And Jesus didn't just go preaching, but he also did not just go healing and meeting needs. He combined both. I was having a conversation with my friend Matthew here. By the way, for those of you who don't know, raise your hand, Matthew. Matthew right here is our Bible instructor for Bible study instructor for the church. He's just the coordinator, okay? Because there's no way we expect for him or me or any of us to give all the Bible studies. And here's the truth about this message here. All of us should be giving at least one Bible study. Ooh. I need you to say that, but I need you to put in the first person. I need to be giving at least one Bible study a week. Okay, I want you to say that with me. I know it's going to be hard, but just so I know that the truth sank in. One, two, three. I need to be giving at least one Bible study a week. Thank you, Jesse. Where's Jesse? Jesse's not here. He's, oh, he's back there. Thank you, because I know you've committed. But Matthew is going to be making some phone calls and asking you to commit. And I know what you're thinking now, some of you. You're thinking, what? I can't give a Bible study. I don't know. I need my Bible studies myself. You know, they have a, oh, see, I, don't, I cannot hear. <laughs> you know, this is not one of those situations, you know, when uh, in the Bible, when you read something like Jesus is talking and then the disciples are like talking amongst themselves and they're like, and then the Bible says like, and then Jesus addressed them because he knew their thoughts. This is not that, okay? I did not hear what you guys were snickering about. I need Bible studies myself, you may be thinking. Listen, for you who are saying, I need Bible studies myself, listen, I got something for you. Don't even worry about it. It's super easy. Everybody can do it. Now, some of you are saying, like, yeah, let's do it. Let's pick up that Bible and let's give the Bible studies. But for those of you who can't do that and are feeling nervous about that, we have a system that will totally work, that just requires you to show up. And show up to your neighbor, show up to your friend at school, show up to your coworker. You just need to show up and commit. And all of us, myself included, we need to be engaged in this work because Jesus did not just go meet needs. He also taught the good news about the kingdom of God. And in verse 36, 
He says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion. So here's the question. Are we going to be like these guys in the jail cell that are telling, um, you know, Paul to leave the city? Are we going to just leave the people and forget about them and give up on them? Are we going to condemn them? You know what? They're far beyond saving. They cannot be saved anymore. Are we going to just avoid them altogether? You know what? Let me not make eye contact. Let me take a different route. You know? Let me take a different route. Or are we going to engage like Jesus? Are we going to love like Jesus? Are we going to show compassion like Jesus? Are we going to meet needs like Jesus? And are we going to teach like Jesus? The question is, And the appeal is for all of us. Which of the two are you going to do? Are you going to pick? And by the way, this needs to be said. When we talk about the city, of course, we mean the literal city and the people of the city. But I do want you to remember that the city is symbolic of the people in the city. Just like when we say we're going to church, we're not talking about going to a building. We're talking about the people. You and me make the church. We make the church. We are the body of Christ. Well, the city, they're people. And you know, not literally, there could be a city person, and I'm just saying city person. City person is just representative of that person that does not Uh, fully align with your core values. It's not living the life that you're living. Perhaps it's engaging in activity that you disagree with and they disagree with you. That's who the city is. That person. Are you going to avoid it? Are you going to not have a conversation because they drink certain drinks or they put certain things in their bodies that you don't agree with or they live a certain sexual lifestyle? What are you going to do? Are you going to just avoid it? Are you going to ignore it? Are you going to leave it? Are you going to condemn it? Or are you going to love? Because Jesus calls us to love. Jesus calls us to serve. It's a choice that we all have to make. I can just preach it, but I can do nothing else. The Holy Spirit has to do everything else. My job is to preach it, and the message comes to me. Jesus calls us not to run away from the brokenness but to engage it with love. It's not easy. We're not saying it's easy. We're saying it's necessary. Jesus commands us, Mary, in Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If we ought to do that with our enemies and those who are persecuting us, how much more with the people who are broken and hurt and in the cities and those who represent that. How much more? I saw a documentary once, National Geographic's. It was about 9-11, and we're in September 11. By the way, Elizabeth, I recently found out that was your birthday. I can imagine what that must have been like. And uh, we have somebody in our church who lived in New York during that time, Marisol and her family, Alex and Ryan, who probably remember that day very vividly, and some of us could only imagine. But this documentary is um, from National Geographic. They captured enough footage from people's cameras, cell phones, whatever, enough footage to put together the entire 24 hours of what happened on that day. And on that morning, on September 11, 2001, the world watched in horror as two planes crashed into the World Trade Center towers. Chaos erupted, flames engulfed the buildings. Smoke poured into the sky and screams filled the air. People were trapped inside, desperately trying to escape. In that moment of absolute terror, no one would think it was wise to run towards the burning buildings. Just like you said, Danny, in the jail, people were running away. Imagine standing on the streets of New York watching the debris fall from the sky as the tower began to collapse. The ground shook. The sky darkened. 
the fear was overwhelming. The instinct to survive was the only thing anyone could think about. Get out. Get away. Save yourself. But while thousands ran to safety, a different group of men and women made a shocking choice. Firefighters, police officers, and paramedics, they ran toward the chaos. These brave souls did the unthinkable. They entered the burning towers to save lives. They didn't stop to question about their own safety or consider the risk for them. It was enough. It wasn't about the danger. It was about the people inside that we're going to save. One firefighter, Italian Chief Orio Palmer, made it all the way to the 78th floor of the South Tower. He and his men were among the few who reached so high where people were trapped, people were scared, and people were certain they would never see their loved ones again. Palmer knew the risks. He knew the building could collapse at any moment, but he pushed forward because lives were at stake. Many of these heroes, like Palmer, they never came back home. They gave their lives knowing full well the danger, yet believing the people they could save made it worth the risk. In total, 343 firefighters lost their lives that day, but their sacrifice saved countless others. These men and women didn't run towards the building because it was safe. They ran because it was necessary. As we think about their bravery, it's a reminder that love, true love for others means stepping into risky, uncomfortable places. Jesus calls us the same way to love others. Jesus calls us to love the city, and it doesn't mean that it's without risks. In fact, he warns us of the dangers ahead. He says in Matthew 10 that I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. He says to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. His strategy isn't to avoid the abandoned city. It, wasn't, it was to approach it wisely and with love. Jesus understands the risks, beloved. We're not saying that this is without risk, but he wants us to engage because it is necessary for salvation. Like those firefighters on 9-11 who didn't run towards the tower because it was safe or risk-free. They ran because it was necessary to save lives. God calls us to run in that same direction. But let me tell you, even though it's risky, in a certain kind of way, it's not. Why, you ask? Because even in the worst case scenario, even if we lose our lives in our engagement to the cities and to the brokenhearted in these situations, God can bring us back. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though he dies. In another scripture, it says, where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where, O oh, death, is your victory? And yet in another place, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, be of good heart. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. Jesus not only asks us to do something and to take a risk, he doesn't ask us to do anything he hasn't done himself. He knew going to Jerusalem would be trouble. Even he would lose his life. But he went anyway. Even when Peter tried to talk him, talk him out of it, Jesus went anyway. Because you're worth it. Because he thought I was worth it. Those people out there are worth it. They are worth the life of Jesus, but they are worth it simply because they are children of God. We have a choice. Will we leave 
Will we leave them? Will we condemn them? Will we avoid them? Or will we love them? You know, they say that we need consent. Right? Nobody wants unconsented anything, right? And so God says, are you on my team? Are you on my side? And if you want to love them, demonstrate it just by standing up, and I'd love to pray for you. If you want to say to God, God, I want to love them. Maybe I've been avoiding them. Maybe I've been, you know, leaving them. And maybe I've been condemning them and judging them. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to love them. Father in heaven, you see your children standing up because they're joining your kingdom culture. Father, you see the risk ahead of us. You yourself said that you're sending us among wolves. Lord, may the bravery of those firefighters and those police officers and those paramedics who thought it was worth it to save somebody out of a building so that they could continue living here on this earth even though they will die one day later. How much more, Lord, should we be willing to risk? Because the stakes are higher. Because the stakes are eternal life. Lord, we don't need to go to the city. I understand we just preached about that. But as a church, as your body, as your hands and feet, we actually just need to go to the next person. So as overwhelming as going to the cities can be, and yes, we need to do that as a church with projects and things like that, the message for this morning individually is for me to go to the next person. Who am I going to talk to? Who am I going to approach? Who am I going to love and meet needs and wait for the perfect opportunity that you will open up so that I can share this wonderful gospel? May the Holy Spirit speak to us clearly about who that is. We love you, Lord. Seal these decisions in your lovely name, Jesus.